This video started with a Amazon review of a book that someone was looking at who emailed me. And the person doing this Amazon review made this statement that the author's theology is about to be imposed on the grammar of the New Testament in this case. And it was coming from a book, a title of a book. I'll talk about this another time. I've got another video I want to do about this. But the point I'm trying to make here is that this comment, the author's theology is being imposed, sounds really dramatic. It sounds terrible. Who would want that? But yet there's some major issues with this, and it's a very generic, broad, and frankly useless statement. Which theology? How important is that theology? And how do we know whether we should buy a resource or not buy a resource? Well, all of these questions come together, and it really made me think, how do you know how to choose good resources? Now, I'm going to cover this in a lot more detail in a later video, but as I was reflecting on this and planning for that video, it occurred to me that I really need to provide a way for you, uh, the, my, my viewers, who I love, to be able to think through doctrinal issues so that you don't give you know, generic feedback like this. You can think carefully. And this has significant theological and unity implications for us as the church as well. So in this video, I'm going to review a book and share its importance with you with the hope that maybe you'll benefit from this book as well. Let's get into it. One of the great problems that we have in the Western church today is division. We have people who go to a church for a little while and then leave over some doctrinal issue. And they'll go find another church and then they'll leave that for another doctrinal issue. And they'll just church hop, right? Thinking that they're looking for this perfect church that has just the right theology or teaches truth as it may be according to their own rubric for what truth is. And what gets lost in all of this is the testimony of the gospel that the gospel is intended by God and given in order to change hearts to make us more Christ-like. In other words, what we do is we exchange character for conviction and we focus on having right convictions and we don't focus on having right character. And the important thing to realize is that none of this is to say that convictions are unimportant. And that's really what I want to focus on in this video. Which convictions are important and how would you know? How do you know when you should divide or leave a church or divide from other believers? And how do you know whether you should learn to unite with them and grow together with them? That's what I want to focus on. Because if we don't know where to draw those lines, what happens is that we splinter into increasingly small groups. And in the country that I live in, New Zealand, I see this. We have new church plants popping up here and there. But frankly, they all struggle. And the church is struggling in New Zealand because of this doctrinal division. And so I want to encourage you to be able to think carefully through what doctrine does or should divide and which should not. Because if we keep splintering into smaller and smaller groups, A, we're not going to be able to work together. But more importantly, it really goes into the survivability of the church. Will the church survive if every member of the church is a church in their own right, which doesn't work together with other churches or people because ultimately if we splinter we die and this is a great way that the devil has of really dividing and conquering the church and so we need to know how do we work together when we have disagreements when our doctrine is not you know completely on board with those around us and so i wanted to share a couple of thoughts first of all from ephesians chapter 4 verse well verses 1 right through to verse 13 ish really so well, beyond that too, but there's two key things I want to see. I want you to see in verse three. We see in both verse three and in verse thirteen this tain inotita, right? And and this has the idea of the unity. And in the first verse, verse three, it's the unity of the spirit, and we're commanded to maintain the unity of the spirit. This means that there is a, a unity that we as Christians have by merit of being joined to Christ, united with Christ, which we are to be diligent, the wording is there, to maintain. Okay, So we are to be diligent to maintain or to keep the unity that Christ gives to us through his spirit when he comes to dwell in us when we are saved. But in verse 13, he talks about this unity of the faith. And what he's giving to us here in this chapter is he's saying we're to keep this unity of the spirit because he's given to us gifted men who can teach so that the church becomes united in the faith. So there's a unity of the spirit which we are to keep and there's a uni unity of the faith which we are to 
attain to and which Christ has given the church gifted men to help achieve. So we are to be growing toward this unity of the faith. So the question here and what we're really dealing with in this video is how do we maintain that unity while we're all at different places in terms of our understanding of the faith, right? And that's where this book by uh, Gavin Ortland really comes in handy, Finding the Right Hills to Die On, The Case for Theological Triage. And it's really more than just a case for theological triage. What he does in this book is he really breaks theology and, and doctrine into different levels of uh, importance or urgency for churches to think about, not, not for you know, God to think about. You know, God is in charge of the heart and of people being saved. We are in charge of, as, as the church that is, of maintaining the unity of and the purity of the church, right? And so the church is, dis, is intended to keep, be careful about who comes into the church. And so to help us do that, we have, or what Ortland does in this book, is he provides us with th four levels, essentially, four levels of convictions or doctrines that we can think about in terms of how do we you know, prioritize these doctrines. Now, this is not to say that truth is unimportant. I don't agree with that. I believe that all doctrine is important, but not all doctrine is the kind of doctrine that we should divide over. And the trick is to find which ones should we divide over and which ones should we not. Hey, if you're getting value out of this, could you hit the like button on this video? That helps YouTube know that this is a helpful video. Thanks so much. Let's get back to it. So the first group is doctrines that are essential to the gospel. These are doctrines that are clear in scripture, are well testified to throughout church history, and continue to be important to the church today. So these are things that we should be, we should be very careful about and, and really, we wouldn't say that this makes the difference between someone being a believer and not being a believer. Rather, it's really the denial of these things that is a problem. So Orland's not saying that you have to have knowledge of these things in an exhaustive way to be able to be considered a Christian. What he's saying is that you need to have, you need to be able to affirm these things to be really accepted into a faithful Christ-centered church as a as a member, okay? And so these would be things like the gospel. What is the gospel? The focus of sin, God's holiness, uh, God's redemptive plan. And, and again, not exhaustive knowledge is necessary, but these are just the kinds of things that we need to be united around. And again, the issue is if we have somebody who's deliberately and thoughtfully and consistently denying, let's say, the Trinity or the holiness of God or something like that, then that would be the kind of thing that we would be concerned about at this first level. At the second level are really doctrines that are, that are urgent for the health and practice of the church. And this would include things like communion, uh, egalitarianism versus complementarianism, uh, baptism, uh, and some other those, those kinds of issues. This is where you typically have uh, denominational distinctions, right? So a denomination, one denomination may hold to credo-baptism, another may hold to pedo-baptism. You know, baptism on the basis of confession versus baptism of children, right? So this would be the kind of distinction we'd have at a, at a denominational level. A couple other things that might fit in this might be uh, spiritual gifts, right? Cessationism versus continuationism, uh, church liturgy, even philosophy of ministry perhaps. These things don't prevent you know, Christian fellowship at all, but they are the kind of thing that would prevent churches from working really closely together if they are held to be significant enough. So these are second level doctrines, and this is really where uh, it's most difficult to work out what are those second level doctrines that should you know, cause us to go to one church rather than to another church. But that's the second level, things that are urgent for the health and practice of the church. The third level uh, of, in terms of this structure are things that are important theologically, but not important enough that we might divide over them. And these are the kinds of doctrines such as, and, and again, it's gonna differ perhaps from you to I as to what might fit in here, but things like eschatology, uh, you know, whether you believe in a literal thousand year period or, or not, right? Those kinds of questions, we can still fellowship together, we can still work together, we have broad agreement on a lot of things, we can be in the same church together, you know, and we can just disagree on these things. And here, and Orland in this sense puts in things like the days of creation and whether it's figurative or literal as well. So again, you know, some people would place those sorts of things as a second level doctrine, others would keep them as a third level doctrine, some might even say it's not even important, so we'll put them as a fourth level doctrine. So this is a third 
level doctrine is doctrines that are important, but we can still work together. We should we can still be in the same church, uh, and we can do so with and have good Christian fellowship and you know brotherly love. Auckland also provides a fourth level, which is really just doctrines that really don't matter a whole lot at all. And he doesn't really provide any examples of this, but you can probably think of one or two of these sorts of things. Now, the key thing with all of this is to remember that the goal here is to be able to think carefully about what doctrine sits at what level, and therefore, can we have fellowship with this person as a believer? And if so, because it's not a gospel-based issue perhaps, then how do we conduct ourselves with regards to these differences? And this is where it's really important, because what he's calling us to do here is to work together, to maintain that unity where we can, recognizing that there are going to be differences. And my personal concern is that we do work closely together as a Christian community as best we can, so that we can demonstrate the character that the gospel is intending to bring into our lives as we interact with one another as Christians. Even if we disagree, we should be able to disagree with grace and with patience and with kindness. We shouldn't be the kind of people who go to war with one another over doctrinal issues, particularly secondary or tertiary doctrinal issues. Instead, what we should do is be able to identify what we believe, why we believe it, and have good, solid, biblical reasons for it, and allow other people's opinions to challenge us, to deepen us in our knowledge of the Word of God, so that we can honor the Lord as we interact with one another with wisdom, and as we encourage one another toward that unity of the faith that we talked about in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 13. Now, I think, like I said, I think doctrine is really important. So I'm not trying to minimize the importance of doctrine, but what I do recognize is that in some places, there are some parts of the world, for instance, in the United States, where you can have a doctrinal position and you can have tens of thousands of people agree with you on that doctrinal position. But in the rest of the world, it doesn't work that way. And if we divide over doctrine without thinking through these things carefully, we can find ourselves very isolated very quickly. And as the church continues to decline in the West, which I'm convinced it is doing and will continue to do for the foreseeable future, and of course, I hope that's not the case, but as the church does continue to do that, we're going to need each other more and more. And so we need to have a framework through which we can continue or start to work together to encourage one another toward this unity of the faith that the scriptures talk about. If you're interested in reading this book, then I'm going to leave a link in the description below. If you've got any thoughts about this whole system of theological triage, I'd love to hear from you in the comment section below. Let me know whether you think conviction or character is more important and why. I'd love to hear from you down there as well. And if you do want to read this book and you want to do so in a group, consider joining the Master New Testament Greek Community Membership. It's pretty reasonably priced, and every month we read a different book together. Some related to Greek, some related to things you know, that are offshoots of Greek like this. But nonetheless, every month we read a different book together and we get on a call and we talk about what we're reading, what we've learned, and so on and so forth. We also have a lot of other calls about, you know, reading Greek texts together, as well as, you know, just calls where we jump on and talk about questions related to Greek as well. We do this every week. I'd love to have you join us inside that community membership as well. And you'll find out more information about that at masterntgreek.com community. Thanks so much for watching this video. I look forward to seeing you again in the future. Until then, keep taking small, consistent steps toward mastery and toward unity. I'll see you then. Hey, if you're getting value out of this video, would you be willing to hit the like button and then hit the notify bell?